Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind him. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Finley to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams is right. Williams gonna throw. One on one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it for a touchdown. Are you kidding me? Connor Barth for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Connor Barth. Good gosh, dirty! This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. Big Heads Media Podcast. Hey guys, and welcome to this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast, coming to you on a Tuesday after one of the most exciting wins, maybe, in program history, because it came after, or it came during a rivalry game, and after a game against Virginia Tech where the Tar Heels could have won one of the more exciting games in uh, their program's history, but weren't able to get it done. Um, we were there, we were in the stadium, uh, we, this, we, we were going to try to podcast on the way home, but, um, as you can probably tell through just the first couple of minutes, I am sick. You guys know, of course, Josh was sick last week, so, uh, we, we felt it was best after yelling for three and a half hours as well to not give you the sound of us trying to talk after the Tar Heels, uh, thrilling victory over the Duke Blue Devils couple things. Uh, great win. An important win for Carolina this year. Keeps them alive in the ACC Coastal, mm-hmm. which, you know, when we get into the preview part of Virginia, kind of hangs in the balance this upcoming Saturday night. Yeah, that's where we'll talk about how weird the Coastal is again, because we just love doing that. But I love how you try to not bring up the fact that I, I had a conspiracy theory to I get to. I didn't know to. how we were going to bring that up uh, to getting, start out the podcast. It's getting started right here. It's very simple. I like how you're just you're just cutting off this game here. Yeah, very simple. Uh, <sighs> last time we recorded was two weeks ago, where I was in person. Yeah, and you had a we had a listener uh, tweet you saying that I deserve more time on air. Did you finally find this tweet? I no, you showed it to me, but uh, I never took the time to go back and find the guy to personally thank him. So, hey, thank you. But it was kind of weird. You, Bobby Casey's is you. Uh, you opened up the microphone for me that day, and on my way home, I could feel a scratch in my throat. So therefore, I think since somebody told you I to talk more, you poisoned me. You got me sick. I've now been sick for ten days. There it is. I've missed work. I've missed my internship. Oh, you da- you're dead. I couldn't you're, write. You are spot on. Right couldn't now. write the. Uh, Trench report for last week's game against Virginia Tech. I blame all of this sickness on you. Yeah. And now that it has passed on to you, I hope it kicks your ass as much as it has kicked mine. Oh. So that is my conspiracy theory. I believe I'm correct. Oh, I, that, I believe you're correct, too. That is exactly what happened. It's exactly you know what exactly happened. exactly what happened. You figured it out. Um. Yeah, spot on. Good, good, good job piecing that one together. So now my analysis from the Duke win. Way to go, Scooby Doo! You it, did well. It uh, it was a weird game. I thought the environment felt weird. The crowd was. It was full. a good. It was a good environment, but you you mentioned it like in the middle of the game. Like there were times where like you could have heard a pin drop in yeah, the stadium. It, it was, was very strange. It was very very quiet. uneasy. Very it uneasy. Felt, it felt. Kind of like what it was, which was Carolina's season 
depending on if you win the game, you put yourself in a position, A, to make a bowl game, which is kind of what we wanted right, in right, the year. Right. And then, B, if you can play for an ACC championship, you had to win Saturday. And it's kind of like you felt that all day. was like, if you lose, now the chances of making a bowl game aren't as great. And your chances of winning the Coastal are all not that great either. And that's just kind of how it felt in the stadium. It didn't help that uh, Phil Longo had another mysterious game plan. It was it. It, it, was, it better, was better. It was a it lot was better still, in the second half, for sure. Still strange, a lot of stuff that was called on Saturday. And that's just what it was. But Carolina made enough plays, especially defensively, for a depleted secondary. I thought they held up just fine. And the front seven caused as much havoc as they've had for any opponent probably outside of Georgia Tech all year long. Or Cle- I would say Clemson. Clemson, they, yeah, Clemson a, they did a really good job. To a certain degree. And offensively, it was uh, never got into a rhythm in the passing game with Howell. A lot yeah. of that was you got to give a lot of credit to Duke's front. Their front four did a, did a good job against our offensive line, kind of helped had uh, Howell uneven most of the day. But when they needed to make a play, whether it was him throwing or on the ground, they had the ability to make that one or two plays and ultimately found a way to win 20-17, to 17, large part thanks to Duke overthinking the situation at the goal line. And throw in the jump pass, which Chasserat, right. unbelievable play to recognize midair that that ball was getting thrown when he jumped, made a, a great play, and Carolina's 4-4, four and four, the victory bell's back home in Chapel Hill, and the season's still out there in front of them. That's right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said right there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that play, because Chas kind of said afterwards that Jay Bateman had told him to look for that play, because Duke had actually run that same play, a couple of years ago when they played Army, and they'd run it two other times. So, I mean, Jay apparently told them right out, and this this led some fans. Uh, there There is a guy on social media that I will we, we will not mention his Twitter handle because he might be crucified by any Clemson fans that may, for some reason, be listening to this. There was one Tar Heel fan that felt there was enough confidence in the air after that play call by... Jay Bateman, to say he may be better than Brent Venables right now. Which I thought, uh, a little over the line. Jay Bateman deserves a ton of credit, though, for realizing that that was a play that they had used before. They'd used it multiple times before. And that in, in a situation like that, they were likely to pull it out. Not only do you have to hand it to... Surratt for making the interception. You got to hand it to DJ Ford, who was the guy that made the initial contact. Because most people, from where we were sitting in our seats, we thought, okay, if he carries the ball, you know, if he just keeps the ball, he's in the end zone for a touchdown. DJ Ford was right there, wrapped him up, would have dropped him. And if you look at the time on the clock, I mean, there there's pretty much a 0% chance they would have gotten another snap off because of how long it takes you to get all your offensive linemen up ready to go, and ha- and remember, you have to be set for one second, before, or, or at least that's what the rules state, before you snap it. So, um, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I'm glad that they made the decision. Uh, Deion Jackson made the decision. But, you know, I, it's something that, you know, when you look back on it, really, it, you know, people will nationally will probably say, okay, well, Chaz Surratt, you know, how much credit can he really get? He should get a ton of credit for that. Jay Bateman should get a ton of credit for that. Overall, it was just a a great job by Carolina to plan for that. Yeah, no, Jay Jay had the right call. Mac Brown thought they were going to throw the ball, but was expecting a fade route, which would have made sense against our corners who are struggling in man coverage. In that that situation. But it it, that's why when we – made the hire of Jay Bateman a December ago, that was the reason why you hired him. Because you know he, right. he's going to be prepared. He knows he's as good as any coordinator in the conference in the country, knowing tendencies, stuff like that. He's up there with the Brent Venables Gotta or be, whatever. Yeah. He's just not done it in a high-profile position like is, Brent Venables. He's not quite on the Venables and, level. Long, long way to go until we can say that. It was it was a very good effort from the defense. Uh the secondary had its moments. Ross had his, had, you know, but in the fourth quarter made some big plays in the passing game. Uh, just, you know, the front four, Jason Strobridge, man, 
up front. Amazing, amazing day. Surratt's going to be the one that everybody's going to remember in this game. But, I mean, Strobridge, hard to argue with the numbers. Ten total tackles, um, which was second on the team on the day. Two and a half tackles for loss and one and a half sacks. I mean, and you got to remember, this is after he was slowed by an injury a week ago against Virginia Tech. We didn't know how healthy he was actually going to be coming into this game. And he comes out and puts up that performance. Uh, yeah, it was just uh, amazing. really, you know, Carolina looked motivated, which was not a surprise. I was kind of worried about the psyche after the Virginia Tech loss in a game that you effectively blew it. Multiple times you had the Pretty game much. won, yep. and you weren't, you weren't tough enough to finish the game. They were tough enough on Saturday to finish, which is part of this team's journey was they, they, they've got to learn how to manage success because they've won more this year than they've won the last two years. And now they're in a position going into November where every game matters. They're not used to that either. Right. And so it's learning how to handle all that and handling success and, and finishing games. And Saturday, they were they were damn close to blowing it again. Chasserat saved the day. And it was kind of funny. We, you know, I, I expected Mac Brown to kind of come out and, and publicly challenge the coaching like he did after we won games against – South Carolina and Miami because the coaching at times put them in a position to not succeed, mainly yeah, on the yeah, offensive side of the ball. Decisions um, still. And, and but. you know, look, they ran the ball 46 times Saturday. That's great. I think we still have a problem with the not, – not the passing plays. It's the time when they decide we're going to throw the ball. And on third and one, we're throwing 15, 20-yard routes – Instead of getting first down. Well, there, were, there was really only one of those that I can remember from the other day where they, it, it, yeah, you were right. It was like a third and it was like third and four, and they decided to throw a long ball. And I was like, I, I mean, I guess um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 the one thing that I will say in defense of why Jay or Jay Bateman, why uh, Phil Longo may be doing that, is we've noticed since really the game against App State, has the middle of the field not kind of disappeared for our wide receivers? Maybe, okay, Georgia Tech, maybe a little bit. But really, these last two weeks in particular, I don't know if it was, you know, the bye week. Maybe you got two teams. I mean, look, Bud Foster is a fantastic defensive coach. Duke is, you know, they, they were highly ranked defensively coming in. They're clearly doing something right. It seems like these teams have done a great job of taking away the middle of the field where the Tar Heels were able to attack early in the season. That that just has not been there. Now, at times, a week ago against Virginia Tech, they were able to attack on the edge. That's where Daz Newsom did a lot of his damage. And then we saw it on Saturday where when they did have to make key throws, they made them down the field. And, and look, you know... Most people would say, well, those are low-percentage throws, not for Sam Howell. That's that's where he seems to thrive. But I, it just seems to me like the, the middle of the field's not quite as open as it was early in the season. No, it's not. And that's <clears> something that Longo is, I guess, we're still in the process of adjusting how right. to get a guy like Newsom the ball in the middle of the field because that's where he's the most electric. Right, well, Toe speed. Groves was the guy that was doing so much damage and, and, in the and, middle of the field. Groves. It's not there, really, um, these last two games. So, so you know, you you got to find some different route combinations. you got to find grass in other areas of the field. Yeah, yeah there right. In the, middle of the, yeah. Field. Uh, the deep passing game, is it's there because you got a quarterback that can push the ball deep, which we haven't had since Mitch Trubisky. It's kind of refreshing seeing the ball get pushed down the field accurately from Sam because his, his touch on the deep ball is as good as you're going to find in the ACC. Can you imagine if Ratliff Williams was in this offense this year? Man, he'd be having a monster year. That's, I mean... Because you look at, I mean, look at Corrales and Diami Brown and just how much success they're having on the outside so far this year. I don't know why you got really soft there. Kind of, kind of freaked me. The out nasal with, kicked in. With, the, with na- the, the, nas- the nasal. But it was you know the sinus infection kicked in for a second. The uh, the the offense is adjusting <laughs> to teams adjusting to them because there is now there's a lot more film out there on what Carolina's doing. With Phil Longo, of course, at Carolina, because entered the year, everything they had was from his time at Ole Miss. But so it's an adjustment period. They 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 handled it well. The good thing is, is they they have the ability to run the ball, and when you can run the ball, they did on Saturday for over 200 yards. All three backs were productive on their carries, 
it's going to open up the passing game and the thing that you want to do in the air. Yeah, let's talk about the law, the law firm uh, really quick. Law, law firm, there we go. Um, to me, I, like, look, you could take away that Javante Williams is, is a monster. We, we knew that already coming in. You could take away that Michael Carter running harder this year, a little more successful. The biggest takeaway for me is that Antonio Williams is starting to sort of find a little bit of a role in this offense. And this this is what what I really like about what they've done over the last couple of weeks is they're starting to try to get him involved. And he's a guy that, I mean, just from watching him last year and this year, he looks a lot quicker, but he still runs with an edge that allows him to break through tackles. I like the fact that they're starting to use him back there as well, and I think it's added even another dimension to this already great Tar Heel backfield. Yeah, well, it has. And if you think back to the early in the year, think about the wins over Miami, South Carolina. When Carolina went on game-winning drives, they were started with his running. It was it was him in the game getting right. the ball, and he had yeah. big runs in both games. He kind of we kind of got away from him for a little bit. I wonder. See, there was a rumor that and and. I think Jacob Turner might have said something last week about it, that he may have been dealing with an injury and just couldn't shake it. And they just, they they didn't release it. It wasn't really public because he's the third guy on the depth chart. His role was sort of small anyways. So, you know, they were, he was still dressed and could be used if needed, but wasn't necessary. I think now, you know, he, maybe he's back to being fully healthy, and he's he was extremely effective on Saturday. Yeah, he so, had five carries over 50 yards. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's damn good numbers As there. your number three back, yeah, I'll take that um, any day of the week. That's awesome. And so, so. It, it does add a, a different element because <laughs> in the fourth, mainly in the, you see him a lot in the fourth quarter because he is a harder runner right. than even Javante. So your defense is going to be a little more tired. It's going to be harder to tackle a guy like him who's fresh. And I I think Carolina's – I think they've now found a way how to use Javante and Carter, how to get them involved in the game early. But then you you just kind of save Antonio Williams for the second half, and he's breaking off big runs because the defense is just too gassed to want to tackle. And so it's it's really been – if Long has done anything good and the offense has done anything good, it's been figuring out how to use all three of those backs. Because a lot of times you've got a lot of talent. Larry Fedora sucked at that. Oh, there's always talent in the backfield. He didn't even want to use one back. Right. He wanted five wide. We, we don't need to use Hood or TJ Logan. There yeah. was always talent it in the backfield. Like it. Yes. There's always been talent in the in the running back position in Carolina. Oh, definitely. They just didn't know yeah. how to use it. Carolina now under Mac Brown, Phil Longo, the new the new staff, they've now found a way to incorporate the law firm as now they're going by, and it's being very productive for a team. And it, it, that may be what carries this team to Charlotte. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Now, I'm interested to see just how well they're able to run against a really good Virginia defense, but we'll talk about that here in a little while. We talked about one great story in this game, which was the performance of Chaz Surratt. We've got to talk about Noah Ruggles, too, because this kid came in, kicks the game-tying and then game-winning field goals in this game. One from 35, one from 40 yards away. I mean... You know, I don't. I, there are probably fans that because they all they always find something to take issue with. There were probably fans that took issue with the fact that they didn't really give Jonathan Kim a chance. But you know, I, I get what Mac Brown was saying. He didn't look confident. We saw it. The fifty-two yard field goal was was not really close. But more concerning to me was this extra point attempt was a duck that creeped through as well. So. He, he, he didn't look confident. I thought he looked good on kickoffs, but they went back to Noah Ruggles, and this is a guy that, you know, look, uh, you know, you, you get a timeout call that people were really not happy with, and a lot of people were using that in defense of you, but you get benched for that. Maybe in your own mind you could have gotten down on yourself or even gotten down on the staff and said, you know what, I don't think I, you know, I, I yeah, I missed a few, two field goals, but, you know, the staff kind of – kind of screwed me over on that. That wasn't the mindset that Noah Ruggles took. He was ready to go when he got called upon, and he came in and, and was fantastic for the Tar Heels on Saturday, hitting two of the biggest kicks that they've had maybe all season. There hasn't been a lot of things that Mac Brown has done that I disagreed with. That move didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I know Ruggles hasn't been great, but he was going to be a lot better than whatever Kim was going to give you, and that was evident his first Kick on Saturday, uh, but still, you got to give a lot of prop to Ruggles for staying mentally tough and prepared. 
and being ready for the position when he had to go back out there to make those kicks. Um, but yeah, I mean that that that's just probably the, when when that got announced. I don't know if, if you and I were hanging out when the, they announced the, the the kicker decision. Just make any did not make any sense to me. I, I but in a way. That's why Matt Brown's a Hall of Famer. It was probably his best way of challenging Ruggles. Right. Was, well, I'll bet you. And. I mean, Max said it coming in. Like, you know, we don't care if you were a starter last year, which Ruggles wasn't. But basically, he was slated to be the starter this year. Yeah. But it doesn't. He said, look, it doesn't matter if you're expected to be a starter or you were a starter last year. You have to earn it. And, you know, what he had been telling people. And apparently, he told the broadcast crew this before the game last Saturday at Virginia Tech, it had come down to pregame warm-ups every single week of who was going to be the starting kicker. And Ruggles just kept beating everybody out. He decided to go with Kim. Um, you know, I, I, I get why he made the move to go away from Ruggles because, I mean, you look, you're 4 of 10 from beyond 30 yards. you got to be a little more efficient than that. But Jonathan Kim was a guy that was 12 of 19 from beyond 30 yards in his career at high school. I don't think that's really going to translate over to college. You're not going to get, I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, he's been good on, on kickoffs, and I think he, you know, he could thrive in that role being the kickoff specialist. I thought he was fantastic at, with kickoffs on Saturday. But, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was very interesting. Um, the other thing is, is like, you know, if if you wanted a bench Ruggles, who else could he have gone to? I I don't really know because I don't know if Michael Rubino got injured. What happened? Why he was removed from the kickoff specialist role? Um, his you know he he kicked field goals at App State and wasn't really all that successful either. So yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Um, I'm the guy that thinks they may end up having to ultimately offer a kicker in this class if you know Ruggles continues to struggle. And they don't think that Kim or, uh, well, Rabino will be gone, but if Kim or, or another guy that's on the roster is the long-term solution, they might have to offer up one of the guys in state that's that's got a big leg and, and just try to secure that position because, I mean, look, Mac Brown said it all off season, and he's still saying it now, and he's right about it. I mean, special teams is, is probably the biggest concern on this team overall because, on the defensive side of the football, it's it's really just how beat up you are that's that's really causing the biggest issues. Special teams, it's it's really more of a lack of talent, unfortunately. So, um, but yeah, I mean, let's look at the defense um, really quickly because uh, you, you mentioned something when you first uh, gave your opening thoughts that that I wanted to talk about a little bit. You know, the front seven had a big day. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Strobridge, fantastic performance. I thought Aaron Crawford bounced back nicely after struggling a little bit uh, against Virginia Tech. Um, all three linebackers were fantastic. Surratt led the team in tackles again with 12. Got another sack, of course, because it wouldn't be a, a Chaz Surratt game without one. Um, and then, I mean, you look at Jeremiah Gemmel, huge day, uh, nine total tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, one and a half sacks, also a pass breakup, and then Dominic Ross, who may have had the best day of everybody, uh, six total tackles, one tackle for loss, one sack, and an interception, and he was a guy that, you know, we I, I pointed this out to you probably middle of the second quarter, I said, look, Ross hasn't come off the field at all, Dominic Ross, or, or Greg Ross, Greg Ross played the whole game too. They are not running a nickel. Dominique Ross or Miles Dorn was having to handle the slot receiver the rest of the game. They didn't they didn't have enough guys to put in the nickel, or at least enough guys that they felt confident. So you had your linebacker in Dominique Ross doing it. And I mean, look, he, he did about as well as you could have hoped for from a linebacker. I mean, he looked pretty good. And uh I, I'm telling you, that was one of the main reasons I thought Carolina was able to hold on and win. And uh, you know, I mentioned the sack. Had to throw that in there. It was a strip sack too that was recovered by uh, Jason Strobridge. So, really, just a phenomenal game for the linebacking core, especially uh, Dominic Rowe. Yeah, he, he he was ready to go. Uh, was you know from the jump he was locked in, and he said that the extra there was extra motivation from being beat by Duke three times and in the way they had been beat. Yeah, you got think you're a senior. So, yeah. you're, you're on the verge of becoming the first four year class to not beat Duke. It might have been in school history, or if not, in a, really a, a very long time. Right. Um, really just a lot of mental toughness, being able to, you know, 
be in a tough position to cover a slot guy because you don't do that normally. And he held his own. Um, it's just kind of it's kind of sad that, that that's how beat up Carolina is in the secondary Tell where it's me, just man. like, all right, we're going to put a linebacker out there. In the, we ain't in, got in, no one else. You got you to find a way. And it's, it's either uh. one of those you're going you're gonna to live or you're going to die. Saturday, Saturday Carolina he lived, lived by yeah, doing he it. He lived. Um, he did a good job. So can't speak enough about him. He was he was an animal, and and you could tell when he got the interception late, which we at the thought at the time kind of thought that was at the time really big play. You know, you could just tell when he ran off the field was really juiced up, and just it was the fun thing about seeing Carolina win on Saturday was seeing all those guys who hadn't beaten Duke, and that was everybody just about on the roster and not experienced us beating Duke. I beat him since 2015. Right. How excited they were to go get that bell. And then they get that Mac w- let them paint the bell yeah. on Sunday. So, so that, it's just was, a, that was awesome. That, that was, was another great. example of Mac Brown getting it. Right. When you, you let the seniors who haven't they hadn't done it. And it's, it's been a long time since we've said that a senior hadn't beaten Duke. But we're, that's yeah, where. He, he made like a whole ceremony yeah. almost out of it. That, it was, kinda, that it was, was awesome. At I first mean, I thought it was kind of funny. I was like, okay, so we're going to like. They've got like paper down in the middle of the field, like yeah. We're yeah. gonna have like the choir out there singing a hymn or something like that, you know. They but, they can't wreck the can't wreck the expensive turf, fellas. Come on, come on. But and, <laughs> and and I think something that we we hadn't we didn't we didn't talk talk about going into the game that really was a big factor. Mac Brown got the job and stressed beating in state rivals. Right. And during the game yesterday, he was zero two. That beat we lost yeah. the Wake Forest, lost to App. And was on the verge of uh, of maybe going zero and three, and and NC State the final week of the year is not going to be easy. Right. So something that effectively cost Larry Fedora his job. Mac Brown, you know, was kind of hired hoping to restore the the glory in the state. Hopefully Saturday was the first step of doing that. You get the victory rail back in Chapel Hill, proved a nine and two all time against Dukes in his two stints as the coach of Carolina, and you know now we got State in the year, but. Really big, big win. You have 102 recruits at the game on Saturday. There you go. A lot of those are in-state guys. And you, you beat an in-state opponent for the first time in a couple of years, so it's a pretty big day. Yeah, first time in the last 12 meetings with an in-state opponent that they have won. FBS, FBS. They've beaten some FCS teams, but they hadn't beaten an, FC, an FBS team in uh, the last 12 tries. They get it done on uh, Saturday. So I wanted to discuss this. Because I thought that this was something interesting that we could discuss here. Because we've been to a few games in Keenan. Unfortunately, we cannot put the geo punt return up there because we were not there. One, we were too young to be able to afford our own tickets. Two, our dads, uh, they, they at the time did not know uh, how big of fans we are. And we did not have a podcast, so we couldn't tell them that this was for work. So we couldn't rope them into taking us to that game. Unfortunately, that one's off the table. But we were there for the comeback against Pittsburgh in 2016, which to us ranks as our best experience in Keenan so far. Does this one top it for you? I don't know. It's it's definitely up there. Every game I was at in Keenan Stadium this year, phenomenal. Miami, great. Very true. It was yes. our, first, our first full-blown night experience of Keenan Stadium, 8 o'clock kick. Uh, the Carolina, of course, fourth and seventeen. We don't know about that. Clemson, as tough as it was, losing the game. We, very, very weird feeling after a loss to we, walk out of there know, like, yeah, I feel really good. We walked yeah. in that game almost thirty point underdogs and outplayed the number one team in the time at the country. They, they literally after the game they had the Tar Heel chant going on after a one point loss. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, I mean. I, I still don't know because Pittsburgh, I mean, okay, let's just set the scene. That was my birthday. That's a good point. Yeah, they for were you, down. I forgot about that as the extra motivation. Yeah, on. they were down double digits with five minutes to go in the fourth Thir- quarter. 13 with five minutes and change, yep. Uh, on the game-winning drive, Mitch Trubisky converted three or four fourth downs. Like, just thinking about all this, like, the, the win probability in that game at five minutes was very low. Be- very low, And yes. even when they got like the 1%. ball back, it was still very low. And then you get the touchdown with Bug in the end zone. I would still probably lean that, although okay. this was fun for me because I finally got to see Carolina beat a rival. I was 0-4 all time. Yeah, you are horrible um, in stadium against rivals. Never seen them beat State. I, never you're seen still them not beat allowed Duke. to go to that game next year because the time you went and saw the basketball team play them in Chapel Hill, 
They scored 46 points and lost. Yeah. So it's you know, that's so just part of it. No I, stay for you. I finally got that monkey off my back. Kind of rival, kind of rivals with Dean Smith back in '82 when he first got his first title. Got the monkey <laughs> off his back. We're kind of in the same boat there. <laughs> Comparing national championships to a fan in the stands against Duke. That's but what it sure, is. Sure, you you draw whatever comparisons you want. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely up there. It was it was just it was a weird game. And I guess the best way to put it is Duke Carolina football. So it's going to be weird. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty accurate. By the way, had to point this out. I predicted two games scores right this year. Predicted twenty to seventeen on the preview podcast for this. So yeah, no, I was I was when we were sitting in the stands at halftime and it's seven three and there were people behind us that were like, This is just a weird game. I'm like, dude, this is this rivalry. It is it makes no sense. The teams just beat the crap out of each other. No matter how bad you're playing coming in. You're always going to find a way to stay competitive in this game. And it went down to the end. I, I'm going to go with this game just barely because it's a rivalry game. You hadn't won this rivalry in three tries. And the atmosphere in Keenan Stadium for this game was crazy. I mean, look, we thought, okay, after the Miami game, you know, we, we knew, okay, other games would be sold out, but we've seen it in, in the past. The environments aren't nearly as good as that first game of the year. The environments had, have stayed consistent the whole season. And they have been phenomenal throughout. So that's what made this one a little bit different for me. It's just how loud the crowd was, how involved they got. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, to have a, a, as big a play a, a made by a guy that is just a remarkable story that just continues to grow... It is amazing, and that's why I'll lean this one. But really, both of them, fantastic games. Now, I, I'm, I'm probably going to put a poll up about this, and I may I may receive some very vulgar messages about this. Was this a better moment than Geo's punt return? No. I don't think so. Don't put that out there. But here's, here's the other thing that's interesting. If you put that out there, we're going to find out who the real rival is because – wouldn't it, if you think that Duke is the real rival for Carolina? Wouldn't you think that beating your biggest rival with an interception in the end zone when they should have scored to beat you and potentially take you out of ACC coastal contention would be bigger than a win against State? Don't do That's it. where I make the argument that State is more of your rival in football, and it's to me it's not really close. I, I'm going to be real honest with you. So that I mean I don't know. So don't put the no, we, we're not, don't put the poll out. That's a death wish. Okay, so we won't put the poll out then. We won't put the poll out. So we'll move on, and uh, let's... We're, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to combine this edition, unfortunately, because I'm going out of town. So, unfortunately, I will not be able to do the preview for the podcast. The good news is I will be able to get back into Keenan Stadium in time for the game, so I will be there. Um, but we're, we're going to combine this episode, and we'll move on and do the preview for the game against Virginia, which now becomes huge because Virginia lost on the road to Louisville. Carolina's win against Duke means both teams are now 3-2 and two in the ACC Coastal. They are atop the division, of course, Pittsburgh behind everyone at 2-2. Two and two. Um, But uh, both teams, as of right now, if you combine the FPIs of both teams, uh, according to ESPN, they think that there's an 80% chance that this game will decide who wins the ACC Coastal. So this is this is pretty much it. Whoever wins this game, you are in the driver's seat, and unless you slip up a couple of times, you're probably going to hold on and win the ACC Coastal. So, I mean, look, th- this is probably the biggest meeting because, look, we, we've always said this. There are some older Carolina fans that really get into this matchup. This has not been an important matchup in a very long time. This is probably the most important Carolina versus Virginia matchup since the 90s. Yeah, it's definitely the biggest game since Mac Brown was here the first time. Uh, you remember Carolina lost a game at Virginia in 95, 96 in the game yeah, that... Yeah, Kildorf threw uh, the interception that, that changed it all. They were up 17. Yep, yep, That, yep. that really killed that, that team's <laughs> chance to maybe compete to win a national Unfortunately, championship. Unfortunately, yes. But this... Uh, this game's got a lot on. This is the biggest game in Keenan Stadium since you'd probably go all the way back to 2015 when Carolina hosted, I think it was Miami, 
late in the season, which was kind of if they win that game, it puts them in a really good chance to win the ACC. And that Miami team was not good. Yeah, either. but so for, like it didn't really feel overly. You felt going in, okay, we're gonna win. This one feels like a toss up. Yeah, so, you, so. You, you've got that seven thirty kick. Uh, so you're gonna have a, a late a, a late game under the lights. It's what Mac Brown got back into coaching for. That's right. You know, you talk about mentoring kids and have a relationship with kids. Yeah. But you, you want he misses this feeling here, coaching in a game that's going to decide a lot, and it's 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 why you get into college football. It's why we love it. It's for these kind of Saturday nights, uh, something we don't get to say a whole lot. But Carolina's avoided the noon kickoff, and yeah, this this is that's right. I think whenever we envision big boy football, which is what I always refer to when you hire Mac Brown, this this is what you want. We didn't expect to get it this year. Year one, this wasn't an expectation to be competing for an ACC Coastal uh, title. But isn't it beautiful? The um, ACC Coastal. The only one who went, I thought that was was maybe me because I I was very optimistic as I always am in the preseason. But this is it. You 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 know you you want to take the next step on the field with something we've been talking about all year long, and you've taken steps. You beat Miami. You beat South Carolina. Right. You played Clemson. You went to Georgia Tech and kicked their ass. You should have won at Virginia Tech. Yeah. You want to take that next step. Then you find a way to win Saturday night. It's not going to be easy. Virginia, Virginia is the coastal version of Wake Forest. They don't do anything great, but they are solid. They're not going to beat themselves. They're going to run the ball. Their defense is as good as a, a defense you're going to play in the coastal. Sam Howell's got to bounce back from his rough game against Duke and play a lot better to give Carolina a chance to win. And so it, it's going to be a, an interesting battle for the ACC Coastal and, and the South's oldest rivalry. Well, you you said it. They don't do anything spectacular. Now, their defense, I, I don't know. I would maybe say their defense is pretty spectacular. You get what I'm saying, though. Like, you know, they're not. They're very boring. They're they just, don't do anything that they're, they're not exciting. Yeah, they're not exciting. They're, I mean, their they're basketball team, team doesn't do anything great. They just, they win. They're not a team that you say, okay, I have to sit on the couch and watch Virginia play unless you're a, a Virginia fan. It just, there's nothing, there's nothing sexy about the way they play. They don't have that superstar that stands out. Some thought Bryce Perkins could be that guy. I mean, this year, I mean, look, he's been solid but not great. I mean, look, he's got nine touchdowns, eight interceptions. He's kind of, you know, he's a high-end game manager, unfortunately. And that was, some people thought maybe he takes that next step, becomes a star in the ACC. He hasn't really done that. And that's the problem with Virginia. This is going to be a low-scoring affair. You're... Carolina's defense has to show up again. They have to show up two weeks in a row, which we, we've seen they, they've done at times this year, and they've got to do it again. They have got to be ready to go in this game because Virginia, they're only allowing 284 yards per game. That's it. I mean, that is ridiculously low for modern college football. I mean, it, again, it's not – I don't know where it ranks in the nation just yet. I'm willing to bet that's probably – top 10, top 15. Um, I mean, it's not Wisconsin levels, although that's probably gone now that they got absolutely destroyed by Ohio State. But this is still a unit that is really, really good. The thing is, if you're Carolina, their offense really not that effective. When they've won games, though, they've put up points. Look at the game against Duke. They scored 48. You can't let them put points on the board. If they start scoring a lot, you're going to be in trouble. Because their defense is, as you mentioned, as tough as you're going to see outside of Clemson in the ACC. Yeah, no, it's, 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 this feels like a 24-17 rock, you know, rock fight. Luckily, Carolina. Love that term. Uh, uh, what a classic. Yeah, Carolina proved, sir, they, they, they could win that kind of game, which is something that we didn't quite know if this team could do. Because we've, we've never seen them do it in our time well, watching. I mean, South Carolina was kind of like that. But it was it was the first game of the year, so I guess isn't isn't just about every first game unless you play an FCS opponent a rock fight like you're just trying to find a way to win it because everybody's still trying to get comfortable with everyone. Yeah, but th- that's that was a little bit different. That game a lot to do about what South Carolina did wrong that allowed Carolina to win. Where Saturday is just going to be Carolina's going to have to play really really good to win. This the, you you're not going to you you can't play like you did against Duke and win most likely. You can't be that hit and miss on the offense. Like like Sam Howell can't go ten of twenty six. He can't. Yeah, he can't yeah. throw two Gotta picks. Be better than that. Javante Williams can't fumble the ball inside the five yard line. 
you know. But the defense has got to bring that same effort. You've got to find a way to man up, toughen up. You're going to be down guys in the secondary, although you, there's a chance you can get a couple guys back this right, week. Right, right. But if if they can't go, put your helmet on and go play. And you just you, you got to make the, the – what Carolina did against Duke was they made timely plays. Virginia loves to make timely plays because that's what that's how they win games. They make plays. That's the that, only way they really yeah, win games. They're not they're, they're not they're not good enough to blow anybody out no, just about. No. Unless you turn the ball over a lot. But they're gonna make plays at times where you're not. And that's how this game's gonna be won. This is gonna be a specials team, field possession field position game if there ever was one. It right. feels that way, it's gonna be that way. Right. And so uh let, let's let's mention the guys that may be back. And again, we say this strongly, may be back. They are going to go through practice, and they will have to see where they are at. Mac Brown is one of those guys that, look, he is not going to put you out there unless he knows that you are 100% or at least somewhere near that. You you are not, he would rather go with a guy that's fully healthy and at least gives you a chance than have a guy that you're going to put back out there and potentially get re-injured. But... What they're saying, Trey Morrison, uh, which is huge, kid broke his arm against Georgia Tech and is already practicing again. That's that's amazing. Miles Wolfolk, um, who you know has a foot injury that he's been dealing with. Uh, Nick Polino, same thing, had a foot injury. He had foot surgery, um, and he, he will reportedly be going through. It seems like out of the three of them, he's the least likely to play. Um, and then Jace Reuter, of course, the backup quarterback, which is. Some people might say, okay, well, how significant actually is that? We were kind of talking about it the other day with some of the fans that were behind us. If Jace Reuter's there, do they maybe open up Sam Howell a little more in terms of what they can do with the read option game? Because Sam, he he does have the ability to run it if needed. I mean, he's a big-bodied guy. I mean, he's 6'3", 225. He's not huge. But he's not a guy that's real thin and is, you know is, is going to get hurt if he runs through. I mean, he he can get first downs if needed, and we saw that earlier in the year. So, I mean, that could be a little bit bigger than we initially thought. But I mean, they're saying Miles Wolfolk is you know the the guy that has the best chance of playing. Here's my thing: out of out of these out of the three starters, which one of these three would be the biggest to get back? I I know who I think. But who do you think? You'd probably lean Trey Morrison. I, I would go with Trey, too, just because of how many guys are banged up at corner. Um, Especially if Storm Duck can't go. Yeah, and and, and, and so, yeah, Trey, Trey's the easy answer. Miles, Miles would be huge, too, though, because that's a playmaker back there. And, you know, as we've seen, in games that they've lost, Perkins does make mistakes. So, you never know. They, they could bait him into that. But... Um, it, it'll be interesting to see wh- what Carolina is going to be able to roll out there. So let's do uh, let's do key to the game. Um, I know mine. You, you kind of talked about it a little bit. Virginia is so good at controlling field position and making those plays late when they need to. And you said the way that they score a lot of points is when you turn the football over. That's what Duke did against them. That's the reason they won as big as they did. that's Carolina has to avoid that. And look, it hasn't really been a concern all year, but it was a concern on Saturday. They turned the ball over three times. That's the first time that Howell has looked like a freshman. And look, this Virginia defense is really, really good. And they do the one thing that right now Carolina can't stop, which is pressure the quarterback. They cannot turn the football over on Saturday. They have to make sure they take care of it. And that is not only Sam, that is also our running backs. You got to be able to take care of the football. Like you mentioned with Javante Williams. I mean, he's, you know, right now leading the team in rushing. He's got two big fumbles on the year. A big fumble against Wake Forest that allowed them to, to start scoring in that game and eventually was what prevented Carolina from coming back. And then the fumble on Saturday against Duke that. To me, kind of resembled the Virginia Tech game from a couple years ago, and the, or the Virginia Tech game from last year, and the Miami game from a couple years ago, where guys fumbled late in games, and all of a sudden, team drives down and wins the game. So they got to be able to prevent that because Virginia is one of those types of teams that can do that. So I think uh, that that's my biggest key: hold on to the football, you'll be okay. Yeah, if you're gonna take turnovers, I'm gonna take uh, 
Carolina's got to win the kicking game and the field position game. They kind of go hand in hand with punting and in kickoffs. But that's – we saw Carolina get backed up for three possessions on Saturday against Duke where they're starting inside their 15. It's kind of hard to go it's, – it's so hard to march 80-something yards against the team. It's, it's not easy. Especially Virginia. <laughs> yeah. And so I think they've got to be good with their special teams coverage when they kick off after, after they score. And punting the ball, you, there's going to be a time where you're going to have to flip field position a couple times. And you got to be able Kieran has got to he's got to have a good leg into it, be able to back that that offense up, make them want to go eighty yards because they're not built to go eighty yards, and, and and that's a good way Carolina can find a way to 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 win the game. It's going to be a, you know, whoever manages the the stuff is going to win the game. All the all the all the all the small stuff you talk about, you know, who runs the ball, kicks the ball better, all you know, all those cliches you hear from Coach Speak. Well, it's November. All those things are now enhanced. It's like marching basketball where all the little all the little things become big. So now all the little small things that we kind of overlook in the modern era of football, well, now they're going to come to light. And if Carolina can perform in those aspects, they got a good chance to win. And that's a good thing uh, because, look, I mean, here, here's, you know, we, we talked about how good the run game is. One thing that I did want to note is that Bryce Hall, the star corner for Virginia, he will not play in this game. So that can help Sam Howell just a little bit. Because, as we've seen, the, the, he's really struggled the last couple of weeks with these corners that have done such a good job staying with these receivers. So, it'll be interesting to see how he attacks that. Also interested to see, um, you know, th- this is a, a team that's kind of similar to Duke in the fact that they have not run the ball well all year. Virginia's rushing attack is nowhere near what it's been the last few years. So, that could help Carolina a little bit. We'll see uh, how they're able to take advantage of that. And, again... Very similar to Duke in the fact that they got a guy that can take off and run if needed. Bryce Perkins can use his legs. So we'll see how they're able to handle that. Um, guys that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about in the next podcast. Who do you think uh, stands out? You like to do the one offensive, one defensive. So. Yeah, offensively, uh, I think Sam Howell bounces back. It's kind of in his nature to, to come back. He's and... allowed to be selected this week. Other weeks he wasn't allowed to be selected because it was just too easy. Yeah. I'll give you that one. Uh, okay. So I, I think he bounces back. Protects the ball a little bit better. And defensively, God, I mean, it's easy to go chat. I think Dominic Ross builds off his performance. Okay. Makes him a little more yeah, confident Surratt's player. Off Can't say Sir um, at this point. So, I'll, you know, Howell, I normally go with him anyway because I just have a man crush on him. But I I think Ross, Whoa. Is, gonna, I think Ross is really going to build off of what he did Saturday against Duke. Okay. Significant thing here, the admitted man crush on Howell. Is it as severe as my man crush for Trubisky? Don't think that's possible. No, because you still blow a guy who shouldn't be a Whoa. starter in the NFL. Um, well, that'll be cut out of the podcast. Hey, you just there's, that's not, there's nothing wrong about that. That will be cut out of the podcast. So, so guys, you you don't know what he said right there, but oh well. Oh, if you're gonna cut it out. out. No, you're a kiss ass to Trubisky, a guy who's not worthy of being a starting quarterback in the NFL. Chase Daniel gives the Bears a much better chance to win. Yeah, he really did the one start that he actually made, and they lost. Oh, so, that game was yeah. rigged. There you go. Congratulations. They we wanted, can they argue w- about that forever. But, they, uh, they wanted to build the Raiders brand look, over in London. We're, we're definitely fans of Sam Howell. How can you not be? I mean, this kid is. I mean, look. Even, now I don't like him because you called him a kid. So now I'm stop. done. Even when. This kid, this guy has a bad game. I mean, come on, dude. The guy still threw. He completed ten passes and still threw for two hundred twenty-seven yards and two touchdowns. I'm just gonna give you an update on the video game. He's thrown for twenty-six touchdowns in six games. How many interceptions has he thrown? He's, I haven't taken care of the football. He's though. thrown eight, and he's on pace to throw for over five thousand yards. There you go. That's a fi- that that's a that's a video game, which we'll actually get back to here in just a little while when we go through. Uh, the 40-yard dash. So I'll, I'll give you my guys. Um, I, you know what? I, I'm going to go with, is it weird? Can I go with Ant- Antonio Williams and not be highly criticized? Because I think he's going to play a bigger role because you look at the amount of carries that Javante Williams has on him now. I mean, added 22 more on Saturday. Michael Carter's a guy that, you know, we've seen, you know, gets he, he had 12 carries. I mean, the most that he's probably going to get in a game is about 15. He's not a guy that... You're keeping out there the whole time. So I think as the season's starting to wear on, and with the fact that Carolina's running the ball as effectively as they are, 
and the fact that they're not protecting the, the, the quarterback well at all, you kind of got no choice but to run the ball a lot. I think Antonio Williams is that guy that comes out, surprises, has another nice day. I don't know if we're going to be, you know, I, I don't think he leads the team in rushing. I still think that's either Carter or Javante Williams. But I think Antonio Williams will have another good day for the Tar Heels on the ground as that number three running back that they rotate in. And then defensively, um, is Strobridge, can we go with Strobridge? Is he allowed? Because, I mean, Surratt's, no, off the table. I'm going to go with Strobridge to, to keep the momentum going. I feel like he kind of realized before the game against Duke, okay, I need to batten down the hatches and get prepared for the end of the season because this defensive line needs me. I mean, look, he's been through a rash of injuries. I mean, he got banged up in the game against Miami, didn't play in the game against Wake Forest, and then really didn't look right the last two games before the bye week. Comes back, looks ready to go against Virginia Tech, goes down with another injury, but he fought through that, got back on the field in the game against Virginia Tech, and then had his best game of the season against Duke. I think he comes out and realizes this defense needs me right now these last (laughs) few games of the season, and I think he comes out and has a great performance. So I'll go with... Uh, Jason Strobridge. Uh, so that th- those are my two guys. Now we go to the game predictions. Uh, who, what, what do you got in this one? I know you uh, you kind of agree with me. It's probably going to be a low scoring affair. Yeah, I I, I do. I, I just feel like Virginia is going to take the the air out of, or the they're going to shorten the game. Carolina's got to maximize possessions. My heart my heart says Carolina. My head tells me this team isn't ready to win this kind of game, and that's okay. It's year one under Mac Brown. You got you got a banged up football team defensively, and you're asking a lot of a freshman quarterback so on what's Saturday the night. Prediction here, buddy. I think Virginia finds a way to win the game. I think they make a play or two late. I think they beat Carolina twenty four twenty one, and it, it's tough. I just I feel like it's it's so hard. What Carolina's going to have to do. So they're just they're, if 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 they were more healthy, I would probably give them the edge because they are at home. And I think this is a game that if Carolina's going to win, the crowd has got to be a factor, and it will be. I think you they for those that are in the stadium, get your ass in your seat at seven o'clock and be ready to yell for three hours. The team is going to need it. It's made a difference this year when they've won the two the, the games they've won at home. They're going to need you again Saturday night. I just feel like I trust Virginia a little bit more. And this is a game that okay. I feel like you, you you you've got to trust a team or two or, or the team to make a t- uh, play or two. I'm going to trust Virginia. We've seen them do it more recently and more often than we've seen Carolina. I'm just concerned with Virginia on the road period right now because their 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 two losses in conference have come on the road at Miami and on the road at Louisville. Are any are are either of those teams better than Carolina? You could debate. With Louisville, Miami is not better than Carolina because we, we beat them earlier in the year. I think that's going off head-to-head matchup. That's how you decide it. You can debate between Louisville and Carolina, but right now it's just something about Virginia on the road. They do not look like the same team that we saw early in the season. And, I mean, look, they, they maybe that's also a product of the fact that they don't play the toughest out-of-conference schedule. And maybe that's something that Bronco Mendenhall down the line will do to get his team more battle-tested to make them into a team that people can feel really confident about. Because remember, Virginia was my pick to win the Coastal in the, in the preseason. But what was one of my bold predictions? That Carolina would upset Virginia in this game. I'm going to stick with that. Um, I like, you know, with, with, with you know what's going in Carolina's favor with Virginia's struggles on the road. The fact that Virginia really isn't running the football that well. Perkins really isn't playing the way he, you know, many thought he would. All that stuff helps Carolina. And yeah, this makes it sound like I'm telling you they're going to blow them out of the water. I think if Virginia was moving the way that we thought they would at this point, this game could be a, a really long game for Carolina. Because there were team people that thought... This team could give even Clemson a little bit of trouble when they got to Charlotte if they were move if they were playing the way that they thought they could play. They're not. I'm going to go with Carolina in a close one because I think you brought up a good point about the environment. It's been there all year. 
it's definitely going to be there on Saturday night because everything that I've seen on social media is pretty much saying this is the biggest game in Keenan Stadium since the 90s. So, I mean, I, I just feel like the environment's going to be there. Carolina is a team that has we they have looked so much better at home than they've looked on the road. And, I mean, we, we know how it's going to end. It's going to be one of those ones where you're going to be saying, can my heart take any more of this? Somehow it's going to have to take more of that, and Carolina is going to find a way to win. I'll, I'll go 28-24 the final Carolina with the victory at home over Virginia, and they take control of their destiny, of course, after that. They go on the bye week before they play at Pittsburgh, which would be another huge game. Uh, although I think, is it safe to say that this is the biggest game of the year? And yes. That there's no rivaling this. Even if Pittsburgh, you know, wins this week and then and next week and sets up that matchup, I still feel like this is the bigger matchup. So uh, I think you know th- this is one that look if you can make it to the stadium, make it to the stadium. If you can find a ticket, find a ticket because you're going to want to be in attendance for what should be an electric environment and a fantastic game between the two oldest rivals in the South. So make sure that you guys are ready for that. That'll do it for the recap and preview part of the podcast. Now it is time for the 40-yard dash. And we will start the 40-yard dash by breaking down the commitment of three-star offensive tackle Caden Baker. Comes out of Fort Myers High School in Fort Myers, Florida. The number 99 offensive tackle in the class. Um, a guy that, look, really is, is it, it, probably a project, um, but look, athletic. He's a guy that's played basketball, um, still has pretty good size at 6'7", 275, but he's a guy that you're going to be able to pull block with, which we've seen Carolina likes to do that a lot with their offensive tackles. They want guys that can be athletic enough to get all the way from left tackle into that right side D gap, like Charlie Heck, like Jordan Tucker, and I think that Caden Baker has that potential. This is a guy that has a lot of upside, but it's probably going to take him some time when he gets on campus. So he's an interesting prospect to keep an eye on, and the most important thing with his commitment, it adds depth at the offensive tackle spot where the Tar Heels were in need of some. Jacoby Criswell committed, or excuse me, tweeted after uh, Caden Baker's commitment that you're going to like the next two commitments that are coming, then corrected himself and said three. This has put off some wild speculation. Again, nothing is really confirmed. Most would think he is referring to the fact um, that Trenton Simpson's commitment has been reopened. Again, Simpson visited Clemson this weekend, but to this point, Clemson has not offered him. Now, the belief is is that if Clemson does offer him, that is his dream school. He will immediately pop to Clemson, and his recruitment would be over. But... They haven't offered him right now. There's no signs that they are going to offer him right now. Some think that because they are all in on Justin Flo, who is a linebacker, a five-star linebacker from California, that they might not end up offering Simpson. But if USC is able to beat out Clemson, you never really know. So who who knows? We'll have to wait and see whether or not um, he ends up getting an offer from them. Um, It could also reference some of the other significant guys that were on campus. Octavius Oxendine, the three-star defensive tackle out of North Harden High School, um, out of the state of Kentucky, Radcliffeville, Kentucky. Um, He had a great official visit, said that Carolina is one of his top schools. One of the guys that kind of snuck under the radar and had his official visit on Saturday is four-star wide receiver Xavier Capers. He comes out of Denmark High School in Alpharetta, Georgia. Um, He's a guy that is very highly touted, uh, rated as uh, one of the top 120 players in the country, one of the top wide receivers in the class too. And the reason that he said he is very interested in Carolina is not only what the coaching staff was able to show him on Saturday, but also the fact that he could play with Sam Howell. That's really playing into him. Also, Jacoby Criswell is a guy that's kind of working with him as well. So that could be really interesting to keep an eye on. Of course, there were some other big visitors on campus as well. Uh, Javari Ritzy, the 2021 four-star defensive end, is on campus again. Peyton Page, the 2021 five-star defensive tackle, was on campus. Most of your normal guys were on campus, and as Josh mentioned, 102 recruits in total on campus. So Mac Brown continues to bring in these huge numbers and continues to make impressions on a lot of the in-state guys who have been on campus 
a ton so far this season. And the last thing that we'll tell you on this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast, this is more of a national storyline, but of course it will affect Carolina. The NCAA announced earlier today that they will be allowing athletes to profit off their name image and likeness. Now, this will be for, uh, you know, this might most likely means that they will bring back uh, jerseys. They'll actually probably have names on them, so you'll be able to buy your favorite player's jersey. That means you'll be able to buy a more authentic looking Sam Howell jersey this offseason rather than buying the ones from over China, over in China and hoping that they get to you. Um, but uh, that's, that's huge news, uh, and the, of course, one of the biggest things that everybody's talking about right now on social media. That also most likely means the return of NCAA football, the video game, so uh, we, we will be excited about that. Of course, we'll be talking about that on here if that does come back out, because uh, you know that we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be uh, getting that. We were talking earlier, we will probably have to purchase the newest system to be up to date on everything, unfortunately. <laughs> Coming from a guy in me who hasn't played video games in well, probably about two or three years on a consistent basis. But college football comes back out. Uh, I will probably be fully back into uh, video games. Uh, definitely the college football video games. So that does it for this edition of the Heel Up Blog podcast. Of course, we will have the recap edition of the podcast next week. I think uh, we'll go back to the regular schedule next week where we will separate. We'll do a recap for the Virginia game. Um, and then, uh, actually, no, yeah, we'll have to do just a recap for the Virginia game because then we have the bye week. Um, we'll, we will have a bye week edition of the podcast, um, you know, depending on you know what the Toriels do in the game against Virginia. Most likely it'll be just kind of what's the road to the ACC championship game. Maybe a look forward at some of the bowl games that we could possibly be in. Um, if they do end up going down to Virginia, um, not you know might still kind of discuss some things, but we'll have something in store for you guys and ready to go for the bye week. So uh, it should be a very exciting time as Carolina um, is still still hanging around. There were some people that thought after that Virginia Tech game they were dead and gone, but. This team is, is just, you know, look, it's just like every game that they've been in this season. When they look like they're out of it, they're never truly out of it. They're going to continue to fight and fight, uh, find a way to get themselves back into contention. So uh, we want to uh, encourage you guys to uh, subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you go and subscribe on uh, iTunes, uh, their podcast app, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, uh, Spreaker. It's on there. You can subscribe to it as well if you want to go to uh, the regular site that we uh, post through, the main site, um, as well as, of course, you can go on HeelToughBlog.com and check it out there. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the newsletter on HeelToughBlog.com so that you don't miss any of the great articles. we got articles up right now. Uh, the latest two that were posted were the two scouting reports on Cedric Gray and Miles Murphy, so you guys can check those out. Um, as well as uh, we got some great stuff on there about Caden Baker's commitment. You can go back and read what we learned from the game against Duke. And then later tonight, I am going to get the stock report up for you guys. So make sure that you check all of that out. Also, we've got uh, plenty of basketball stuff on there. You can go back and read about Caleb Love's commitment as well as R.J. Davis's commitment. And then, of course, uh, there's some other good things on there. Read about the three players that will be out to start the season um, and what kind of effect that will have for the Tar Heels as well as uh, a couple of uh, preseason awards that were handed out. Read about those. If you hadn't uh, read about Cole Anthony getting uh, on a couple of watch lists, as well as Garrison Brooks landing some preseason honors. So, once again, want to thank Josh for fighting through this podcast. Want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, go Tar Heels! <laughs>